Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm your host, Bob DeMarco. On this edition of the show, I'm speaking with Spencer Marquardt, who, along with his business partner, Steve Laughlin, created the Finch Knife Company. Finch first came onto my radar with the small but stout Runtley, a knife that sounds like an adverb and cuts like a demon. It also earned my coveted 2020 Christmas toy unboxing knife of the year. Since then, I've kept my eye on their growing roster of folders, and one thing has become apparent. The Finch Knife Company creates knives of robust build, vintage character, and undeniable charm. And I'm excited to find out just how and why they go about this. But first, be sure to like, comment, subscribe, and hit the notification bell. And while you're there, check out my knife close-up videos, Thursday Night Knives, our live stream, and the other great interviews with makers and personalities that make the knife world happen. If you think what we do here is valuable and you want to support the show while enjoying exclusive content, uh, and opportunities coming up, uh, you can do so on Patreon. Now, the quickest way to get there is by going to thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. That's thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Do you carry multiple knives, then overthink which one to use when an actual cutting chore pops up? You're a knife junkie of the first order. Spencer, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Excited to be here. Oh, it's quite a pleasure. Uh, like I mentioned before, um, the first I ever heard of you guys was with the Runtley. Yeah, and, there it uh, is. Yeah. And uh, it came out, and I remember thinking, ooh, that's an interesting knife. And, and generally, uh, the knives that are in my collecting wheelhouse, if you will, tend much towards the larger uh, kind of knife. But this one really grabbed me. And uh, as a member of the Apex Pass Around group, I got it in my hands, and then I won it, won it from that group. So <laughs> it was meant to be. Very good. So, so uh, how did Finch come about? So Steve and I, um, we've, we've known each other since we were little kids. We grew up together. Um, Steve's dad was actually my youth baseball coach. Um, we've known each other for a very, very long time. And uh, through the years, we kind of lost touch with each other. We kind of went our own directions and our careers, our families. And I always kept an eye on Steve from afar. Steve also owns a... A, a watch brand called Raven Watches. And I was always intrigued and fascinated with, with the small business that he started with his, with his watch brand. And he was doing something he loved. And um, I was kind of at a crossroads with my career. My family was in the printing business for years. And it was just, it wasn't fulfilling. And um, it was time for something new. And Steve and I got to talking and we just reconnected. We're visiting about our past. And we both love vintage sporting gear. We both collect vintage sporting gear. And um, we got to talking and we thought, you know, what a great opportunity for the two of us to get together and do something we both love. We both collect knives. We collect the vintage sporting gear. I collect vintage fishing lures. Steve collects cameras, camping gear. And um, so it just really took off from there. And uh, we got together on, we, we both agreed on our design styles. We both have the exact same design style. Um, we have a deep affection for the past and the uh, memories of our childhoods. And we're like, there's a lot to build on here. And um, after about six months of trying to hash out a brand and a name, we, we settled on Finch. Steve's, Steve's family roots go deep into uh, Ireland and mine go deep into uh, uh, France and Germany. And so we kind of wanted an old world feel to our brand. Mm -hmm. And a lot of my pocket knives are case pocket knives, uh, hen and rooster, fight and rooster, uh, bulldogs. So I love those kind of European old world kind of designs is what I call them. And um, so we got together in 2019, put it together. We decided to go walk the blade show. And uh, it just we, we left there in love with Atlanta and how great the community was in the knife world. And it's like we have to make this work. And uh, we had a lot of things in our minds about what we wanted to design around. And the Runtley um, was, the, was the starter. It was inspired, I, like I said, I have a collection of vintage fishing lures and I love to fish. 
And with a young family, uh, I just that those opportunities to go fishing were few and far between. So I was like, well, why not a knife that I could carry that reminds me of fishing and all those great memories of, of fishing growing up. And so this is this is the Runtley. This is what inspired. Uh, this is called a river runt, and this is what inspired the Runtley. So this is they don't make these anymore. So you can really only get these on eBay and things like that. So I don't fish with them as often because um, when I lose them, they're expensive to replace. But I've got a fun collection of these on my wall. So the Runtley pocket knife was inspired by this little fishing lure. And I just wanted something that I could put in my pocket and just reminded me, gosh, I wish I was fishing. But you know what? I'm not. But I've got a knife that reminds me of that. So kind of kind of hokey, but we're, we're, we're big sentimental guys. Oh my gosh. Well, I'm, I'm an Italian and we're known for our sentimentality. So <laughs> you're barking up the right tree. Very so, good. Something I find really interesting is you know, how you and Steve both collect vintage outdoors gear. And yeah. it reminds me of, I have this, um, you know, my grandfather, uh, who was born in 1908, you know, uh, you know, over a hundred years ago, uh, was also an outdoorsman. And I remember, images from magazines he had books he had maybe tins and stuff in his basement of these images and 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 i get very um nostalgic for a time i never lived through when yeah. i think of these images but yeah. you know men sitting around the campfire smoking pipes or you know like the old <laughs> remington pictures of the guys shooting the bear and that kind of stuff um how did your love for vintage gear in particular what did, how did that arise yeah that's a that's a Pardon me, I'm having ear trouble, ear, earpiece trouble. You know, it for me, my first my first experience with a pocket knife was probably with my great grandfather, and I was probably eight, nine, ten years old, and we were in Florida visiting my grandfather, and he said, "Hey, I'm gonna I'm gonna whittle you a a whistle out of a piece of wood." I was like, "Okay, great, let's do it." And so we walked around their yard. We couldn't find, he couldn't find the right piece of wood to, to whittle this little whistle. And so we go back into their garage. And so this is my great grandfather. He gets a little saw out and he's got these old cane fishing poles in their garage. And he gets a little saw out and cuts off a piece of the cane pole about that much. And my, my grandmother, his, his, his daughter caught him and, and he got in a lot of trouble, but he's like, I'm making, I'm making something for Spencer. And so he, he started whittling this whistle out of an old piece of cane fishing pole. And um, from then on, that was my first experience with pocket knives. And I just started collecting from then. My dad's a big knife guy. My dad's a big gun guy. Um, so it was probably passed on from him. My first, I remember going to my first knife show here in Kansas City with my dad, probably middle school age. And, and I think where I found the love for the pen and roosters, the fighting roosters, is we went from table to table. And he was asking dealers and sellers and traders, you have bulldogs, fighting roosters, hidden roosters. And if they were starting to say no, he'd quickly move to the next table. <laughs> That's all he wanted. Right. And so I just got to love the pocket knife through my great grandfather and my dad. He just loves, my dad collects flintlocks, he collects pistols. Cool. He's a huge Western guy. So I think my love for the vintage tools and gear and equipment came from, came from my dad's side of the family. And um, my dad, everything he collects, he uses. And he's like, I'm not gonna collect something that I can't actually use and carry or go shoot. And uh, so we wanted to design, so the inspiration for the company was vintage design, you know, at a price point that you're not gonna be scared to carry it, you're not gonna be scared to use it. And, and if you lose it, um, it can be, it's going to be replaceable. And that was really what kicked off our, our, um, kicked off the brand. Now for Steve, his, he was a huge scuba diver. He loved to scuba dive. So he loved vintage, um, dive watches, Seiko's and yeah. Rolexes. He loved all that stuff. And so when he started his watch brand about, he's been doing that for about 15, 16 years. He's got a fascinating collection of watches an incredible collection of, of photography equipment. And, um, so we just, it just, we both just started collecting on our own. And um, this business works because our design styles are so similar. Our interests are so similar. And we just have a huge love for, for the past. And we're trying to recreate that. And we think with our flipper knives, we were kind of trying to marry 
so my, I've got my son collecting pocket knives, but he's all in with the Protex. He loves the automatics. He loves Protex oh, yeah. pocket knives. And I love the fidget factor with those. They're great to fidget with, and they're just so fun, and they're, they're just fun to pop open. But I was just kept going back to all the traditional slip joints that I collected. Mm. And uh, Steve and I were just looking at the two, and how do we – we originally thought we were going to do automatics, and it, but it just stopped. It just didn't make sense. And how do we marry the slip joint with an automatic and the flipper knife um, just seemed to answer all those questions for us. And um, so, yeah, the Rutley is what kicked it off. And um, each knife that we design, we try to tell a story behind it. Like if there's one thing I learned in college in my marketing classes, I was a business major. And, you know, looking back on it, if I could do college over again, it would definitely not be business. Steve, Steve is a trained, he's, he studied art. I kind of am a self-taught um, designer. And so my self-taught with Steve's professional and educated experience, it makes for a good, we complement each other really well. Oh yeah. And so the, every knife we feel like has to tell a story back to the marketing angle is, is we want every knife to somehow maybe connect to our past or connect to something we aspire to. And it's gotta tell a little bit of a story. Um, and a perfect example of that is with our, the holiday pocket knife. It's um, it's a, it's a flipper. Right there it is. And, <laughs> right um, so again, this one, this one was inspired by my dad is an absolute obsessed. He is absolutely obsessed with um, the Wild West. He loves the Wild West characters. He loves the history. He loves the, gold the, the ghost towns. He loves all the stories of the Wild West, the true stories and the not true stories. Mm -hmm. um, and some of his knife collection consists of doctor's knives and pharmacy knives. And so it just made sense. I was like, you know, my, my dad is a huge influence on my life. And I, I wouldn't be here talking to you today if, um, if my dad uh, wasn't uh, so involved in my life. And he's been, he's probably my big influence and my big role model. So I was like, we need a knife. And it, just, it was such an easy knife to put together. Um, it's a simple design. I mean, it's as simple as they come. It's, you know, basically a square, it's a rectangle with a worn cliff on it. And, you know, Steve and I believe in less is more. And our design philosophy is bring in some vintage vibes to it, mm. but keep it simple. Keep them all really simple. Yeah, this definitely has the doctor knife vibe with the with the squared off bolsters. Yeah. And the, uh, I recently, my, my dad is a retired physician, and I got him a uh, case doctor's knife uh, when awesome. they pulled that out of the... Um, out of the vault a couple of years back with stag and i got it with the little spatula i was was fascinated yeah. with that you use that square <laughs> end to to grind down the pill and then the spatula yeah. to stir up a potion but you were talking about uh, each knife having a story and uh -huh. and that becomes really apparent uh when you go on your website and you look at each individual knife now one thing i really love is that um well you do tell a little bit of a story and like a uh, a small paragraph, a couple of sentences to kind of uh -huh. set the mood for the knife, if you will. Uh, but you also have for each knife a a beautiful um, sort of, uh, it's more than a logo, but a, a little piece of artwork that that is sort of emblematic of the kind of mood you're trying to set. And those are the kind of things I was talking about earlier when I was talking about uh, the, the old school sporting goods um artwork it really sets a tone that that uh, kind of lets you know what you're getting into and then you look at the knife themselves and they all have shields the finch shield on it which of course is evocative of the old slip joints and such absolutely and, uh, yeah i think that uh, so how, how do you come up with the artwork and the stories are these uh does uh, steve create those uh images so steve does all of our photography um you know steve steve has a very well-trained eye in terms of, of creative. If it's photography, if it's painting, I think behind me you see a, a red painting. He did that in art class. Steve's art skill goes more, is, is more than just designing his watch brand. And um, every knife starts, before we even really concept a knife, um, we, we have ideas floating around in our heads, but there's, there's the story. And then once we have that story, it all just really falls into place. So we actually hired out a, a graphic design firm to do all of our, um, to do all the, each stick or each, each knife has its own, um, own logo or, or sticker to it. And we just wanted a whole fresh set of eyes. Like you take this, here's the knife, 
here's the name, and here's the story or the inspiration behind it. And we turn that over to a graphic design firm, and they do all that for us. Um, I go, Going back to the, the logo that you see in all the handles, mm -hmm. that's actually a sapphire crystal that um, oh, Steve, no Steve brought in. We wanted to tie in. So when we came up with Finch, um, there was a lot of reasons behind the Finch name, but it tied so well into his, his watch brand that he had. And we just thought there's going to be some great opportunities for cross-marketing, promotional opportunities. And what a way to tie in Steve's love um, for watches is let's take the sapphire that's used in watchmaking and let's apply that to our knife designs. And, and, how do we all, and that also allows us to tie in that old traditional, um, the old traditional look you get with those logos. And so that's actually a sapphire crystal that glows in the dark. Um, now, the glow in the dark is kind of, you know, it's not the most practical thing for NAS because it's, it's got to be charged by a light. Right. Um, but it just plays back to Steve's roots and where he came from. That's, that's interesting that it's sapphire crystal because I kind of intuitively knew it wasn't plastic because it, you know, just I, I've had the finch for quite a while and it's never scratched up. You yeah. know, like like plastic would start to, um, you know, look like brushed. You know, I have that. Yeah. So, but I, I hadn't really given it much thought, uh, and I I can see that it glows, but I I had never given the crystal itself much thought. Yeah, it was. Um, they're tough. If you if you take sandpaper to that crystal, it's not it's not going anywhere. It is not going to scratch. And so that was something we had to work around. Is all right. It's got to be durable. It's got to be unique. And um, it, designing that little sapphire crystal, uh, a lot of blood, sweat, and tears in that thing. Our first batch, we were not communicating very well, and it's completely, um, you know, a mistake on Steve and ours end, my end. Um, we had to completely redo our first round of crystals because um, mm -hmm. our factory, um, Best Tech, who did the Runtley for us, um, we we missed a email from them on the corners of those of that little logo. And that we did a batch, got them to them. They're like, hey, guys, you know, the machining is not going to allow for those tight kind of angles. So we had to start back over. So um, the, the the Sapphire logo is near and dear to both of our hearts. And it's um, it just adds a little bit of charm and a little bit of pers more personality to each knife. We are talking about um, for future models. We've had a lot of requests say, hey, could you do one without that? And we're starting to listen to some of the customers and some of our some of our following say, you know, we would love one. We've actually had guys say, you know what, I'm not going to buy one until you get the crystal out of the, out of the handle. And we're like, oh, okay. So, you know, we we take all the input we can and we absorb it. We, we adjust. And um, Steve and I, we are not going to design a knife that we wouldn't carry ourselves. And uh, we're not big tactical guys. We're not oversized knife guys. We like small, medium-sized knives. And the Cimarron, which you see there, um, to date is our probably our longest knife, and um, and that one is designed solely for backpackers, hi uh, hikers, day hikers, um, lightweight. Steve loved all the different colors because it matches all of his camping gear. Steve yeah. is an avid camper, and he he loved to, to be able to match the knife with his gear, and. Um, so that, that actually is our, our longest knife to date. We're looking at some other designs to maybe go longer or bigger, um, but we're just, neither of us are just the, we're just not big knife guys. We, we like the smaller, the smaller knives. Well, I think um, most knife guys appreciate um, the fact that you're listening to them and that, and that, you know, if they don't want the shield, you're not going to get, I think they're nuts. I think the shield is totally cool. Oh, but, thank you. But I, by the same token, I also really, you know, we all, especially people who spend a lot of money on knives, yeah, um, we like to know that companies are listening and that, you know, you're not going to um, compromise your own vision, but at the same time, you're going to listen to what your customers, who obviously already like you enough to tell you what they want, yes. uh, you listen to them. And, and I think that that's, you know, that is something, that's a, a characteristic of a company that most knife people love. So you're talking about the Cimarron. Something I love about the Cimarron, besides the the beauty of the multicolored uh, G10, you know, you've got the the yellow on the inside, the gray on the outside, or uh -huh. the other co color combinations. But I love how the entire blade fits within the handle. 
I also love how the handle is completely neutral. So you can hold it in any grip. And if you, you're calling this a, a backpacking knife, well, if you're out in the wilderness, you don't know what grip you're gonna need, you know? <laughs> That's right. So I, I like I like the totally neutral aspect of, of this design. So, so you the, what's that? Sorry, I was gonna no. say the, the, the funny story of the design of that knife. I mean, that knife is really as simple as they come. Um, but so quick story on that one is yeah. I was with my family. We were we were going westbound on I-70 on a family trip. And the kids were asleep, my wife was asleep. I was fighting sleep and then just out of nowhere comes this Winfield farm. And it's just like all of a sudden he's like, wait a minute, am I, am I in the twilight zone? Am I dreaming here? <laughs> and you look at these wind farms and they're just, they're just, they're so majestic and magical and simple, but so, such a powerful machine. I was like, you know, there might be a knife in there. There's, there's a knife in there somewhere. And so we got back from vacation, told Steve about this little moment I had of, when I thought I don't, I didn't know where I was for a second. And so the Cimarron was born on, on an interstate in Western Kansas oh, as we were cool. heading on a family trip. Yeah. So what is your design process like? You come back, you say, Steve, I, I had this vision. I saw these giant three bladed windmills and was inspired. Now, where, <laughs> where, where does the design, how does the design process proceed from there? Yeah, you bet. So Steve, Steve really has let me take in the reins on the design and um, which has been a lot of fun for me. There's I, I over the years I've known I was like, there's there's something in me. I was like, I'm not a business guy and there's something creative. In me. My dad's a creative person. My mom's a creative person. Their parents were creative people. And it's like there's something there and I could never quite figure it out. And it, it finally hit me that it was knives. So to answer your question. So Steve's really said, Spencer, You've got some stories. You've got some ideas. Let's let's run with that until we exhaust it. And what's been fabulous is as we're working on a design or as I'm working on a design, Steve will come over to my side of the office and, and take a look and he'll have suggestions. And, and, you know, he has he has seen and done it all with his watches. And so so we really work really on a flat surface. We start with a hand sketch, a hand drawing. Or um, we'll jump on Illustrator or Photoshop, uh, primarily Illustrator. We do all of our designs really in two-dimensional. And um, we'll tweak it and revise it. We'll play with colors. We'll play with blade shapes. We'll play with handle shapes. We're not, Steve and I are not, we're not big into the ergonomics. We don't get into all the fancy curves and choils and all those different shapes. We, we really just go after the traditional design. And... Um, so it starts very simple as a flat 2D drawing, usually in an in illustrator or a hand drawing. And then once we kind of fine tune that, then we'll blow it out and then get really detailed on pivots, on um, spacers, uh, materials. And then from there, we'll, we'll blow out the design, turn it over to our, our two factories that we work with. It's Best Tech is doing some of our work. And then we're also uh, working with QSP. Oh. We met both of them um, at uh, Blade Show in 2019, and I, I just tell you, it's they have been um, they've been fabulous. I mean, they have been absolutely fabulous, and their customer service, their quality, they're they're building the knives at a price that at a cost or at a price that we can pass along to the end user. Um, so once we once we turn over the kind of the aesthetic cosmetic 2D drawing. We, we give it to our, our, our factories and let them really do the engineering. Steve and I, we're not knife makers. We're mm -hmm. not, we don't, we don't understand the geometry and the engineering behind it. And we're like, let the experts do that. We're not experts in that. We, we have stories to tell and we want to market and sell a specific style. And so we've just really turned that over to the factories and they've just been absolutely fabulous. So once we turn in our drawing to them, they'll kick out really kind of like a CAD or a, like a line drawing that really shows um, dimensions and size and, and that sort of thing. Once we approve a line drawing, um, they'll do like a 3D rendering for us. So it really starts coming to life. At the 3D rendering stage, you'll know if you've got it or not um, mm -hmm. when it starts to pop on the page or on your screen. So when we get to that 3D rendering stage, We've had to make some changes, but we hate to do it, but we know we've got to make it right because we've already kind of bypassed, you know, is it, should we round out the backside? Should we change it? Should we change it to a spear blade or, 
or, or whatnot. So once we get to 3D rendering, um, we can make changes. The factory is just wonderful on, on allowing us to make those changes. And then once the rendering's approved, um, really we jump right into prototyping. And uh, we'll, we'll prototype everything. And um, once the product, when the prototypes come in, um, we still might have a change too. Once we get it in our hand and feel it, it's like something might not be right here. Yeah. And we've done that with several of our lines. So Runtly, we got, we were very fortunate. We, we, we just hit the ground running with that one and no issues, no changes whatsoever. When we got, when we got the, uh, the 1929 in, this is the model 1929. When we got That's this so little guy cool. in, um, this is, this is my favorite knife. I, this is the one I carry. Uh, I carry this one every day. I love um, it with the jig bone. I love it. It turned out so bone. great. Yeah. Yeah. So our, our first run on these, we designed it with just wood, carbon fiber, and I think it was just wood and car. Oh, no, and, and translucent or JG10. So on our second run, we wanted to add bone. And so our factory got back to us and said, well, you know, the bolsters, that first, that first run was done with a certain depth on those bolsters. Like we need to redesign this to beef up the knife to support bone. And so we redesigned it just a little bit. Really, if, if you felt if you felt a first run and a second run, 1929, they're drastically different. But you would never know that uh, if you just had one or the other. Um, but so the, the the issue with the 1929 was just the flipper tab was a little too low profile; it wasn't grippy enough. Mm -hmm. So we had to make those adjustments um, after prototyping. And um, QSB just nailed it. Like you want to reprototype it. And, you know, we just we just take their lead and completely trust them on that. And so, like, once we beefed up the, the flipper profile about, you know, it was like all it needed was like a half a millimeter. We're talking really nothing at all. Right. And but they look out for those things. And it's something if we would have got if we would have produced that run, uh, we would have gotten those knives. And I don't know if we would have sold them because it would just been you would have gotten you're like, I, I can't flip this thing open. This isn't yeah. working. So we worked through those kinks. They just been great. So how um, you you say that you're both not knife makers? Uh, obviously, you're you're pretty damn close. But uh, oh, thank you. <laughs> you're welcome. But uh, in in creating these designs, first in sketch form, and then uh -huh. in Illustrator or Photoshop, Illustrator, I guess, primarily. Mm -hmm. How much do you find once you deliver the design to your QSP or your best tech mm -hmm. that that it's coming back or or that you need to make changes um, visually because you weren't accounting for certain lock geometries and that kind of thing that you don't know about. Yeah, no, they, the, they are, they're, they're really good. They're, they're engineers, they're design engineers um, are really good. When we turn in our designs, we always finish that conversation with them with, and please have your, if there's something your, your engineers see, that's a red flag or they don't like, we give them that liberty to make the change. And then if they do make that sort of change, they'll let us know when they send us their files. So if we'll see something like, well, I didn't quite submit it that way, but they'll give us a great explanation on, um, on why they might need to make a change. But for the most part, other than the flipper tabs, um, the, the communication has been spot on. Uh, you, you're, you've talked about the flipper tabs a couple of times, and and that's kind of uh, a, a big part of where Finch's designs uh, reside. I really like how low profile they are, but they're super uh, effective. You know, um, they you know you've got a jimp or two on all of them uh, on this flipping surface, and you know they work beautifully. You know, and um, so I really uh, appreciate how it's not a giant flipper tab that's sticking out. It's not there necessarily. It's it's not doubling as a finger guard. You know, sometimes on a tactical design, you want a, a larger tab so that, mm -hmm. you know, when you're in a knife fight, your your hands don't <laughs> run up onto the blade, you know, but uh, but here it's it's a it's there for not only to deploy the blade and low profile, but it, it it's also a nice surface to grip mm -hmm. if you got to choke up a little bit instead of a mm -hmm. choil, you know, which mm -hmm. you said you're not into you've got this other part of the tab that is also jimped uh, on the dorsal surface that you can kind of just grab with your finger and come up closer to the blade. Yeah. So the, the, the Rutley um, up, up on the front, it, the, the flipper tab runs right up to the edge of the, of the front of the handle scales. 
And so we could actually make this one a little more low profile than let's say, um, you know, if, if you look at it compared to a holiday or a 1929, um, it's just it's just a little bit more low profile because it does butt up right next to the, um, it just comes right even with the, uh, with the front edge of the, of the handles. And so it just allows you to give you that little bit of extra grip. And so, yeah, the Rutley was just supposed to be compact and just small as can be to really just, we really were trying to basically take a, lure, a fishing lure and how do we make this thing low profile and how do we make it cut something? And this is what it ended up morphing into. And um, we, we've had some guys say, you know, too small. This, this guy's just way too small for us. So we are actually, so the Runtley has been, we are just finishing our fifth run of Runtley. So it's, it's done really, really well for us. Um, we've had some of our dealers and we've had some customers say, hey, what about a Runtley XL? Oh. So we are, we, we are looking at a, a Runtley XL that's going to be um, blade length. If I remember right, is a little over maybe about three and a quarter inches. The handle's a little over four inches. So we are going to go with a little bit bigger one um, and, and see how that one does. The, the little this little guy did really well for us. So uh, it might be time to do the Runtley XL, and um, we're going to prototype it, see how it looks. My, I, I just don't want it to be this over. I just don't want it to be a big heavy brick. Yeah. And I, I'm worried with with the with the profile of the blade, you know, how big can we go? But but Best Tech's going to steer straight on that. They've been fabulous. Well, I mean, part of the part of the charm, and 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 I would I would imagine the success of the Runtley is how small and Runtley it is. Yeah. Um, but I mean, this is a design that is begging to be uh, enlarged, and and I, <laughs> I, I I know I know I'm I'm a little biased because I love larger knives, but I also love, I love that blade profile. And, and really, if you're concerned about a too big or too broad, a, a blade, you should, you know, I'm sure you're aware of some of these just ridiculously oversized cleavery blades. They're out there. Yes. Yeah. So I, I, I don't think you have anything to worry about on that front. I would imagine people will, will, uh, you know, will fall all over each other trying to get them. Yeah, it's been it's been a fun design, and I, I love telling the story of, of all the stories of all these knives. It's one of my that and the holiday. You know, the, the holiday being sentimental for for because of my dad, um, but the Runtley is. You know, I've got a I've got this set of fishing lures hanging in our TV room that my wife has to look at every day, <laughs> and I got a little light shining on them. And I just, you know, my, I, my kids love to fish now. So we're we'll able to spend more time doing those things. And, and the great thing, I guess you're showing there, the, the colors, a lot like the fishing lures is, you know, it, the colors are endless with this knife. You can go, you can coat the blade, you can go G10, you could go, we did a wood version. Um, we're looking at maybe doing some Micarta versions. Ooh, yeah. And um, so it's just, it's, it's, it's a, it is a fun little knife that, um, it just tells a cool little story. We're, 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 we really love it. Uh, what is the the knife? I'm sorry, I'm forgetting the name now. Um, it's a beautiful clip point, and in the picture, it's got a wooden handle. It's next to some pennies. Is it uh, the Drifter? Yes, the Drifter. Tell yeah. me about the Drifter and where this came from. I absolutely love that blade. Uh, I think it's a beautiful knife. Um, uh, let me tell you my impressions before you tell me. Yeah, yet. go for it. Let uh, me hear it. To, to me, I look at this and it reminds me of a very you know small version of a classic buoy. It's mm -hmm. got the, the the clip point blade, but it also has sort of the coffin shaped handle of a of a classic <laughs> buoy. And uh, I really I dig it. I dig it. Yeah. So the drifter. So I mean, you hit you hit it right on the head with the, the nail right on the head. Steve's like, hey, we need a Bowie knife. We need a Bowie knife. We need a bit, it needs to be small. We need to carry it in our pocket. And it's like, what do you think? And I was like, yeah, let's, let's look at it. So the, the, the name actually came from, you know, we, we live in, um, well, it's not so country anymore because everything's growing up around us. Right. But where Steve and I grew up and where our office is and where we both live, um, a lot of train tracks. And, um, you know, we we always had that fascination of let's let's hop on our, let's hop let's hop on one of these freight trains that rip by all the time. Yeah. And I was like, yeah, not such a good idea anymore with kids and and the, the train companies will you know whip you up pretty good if they catch you. And 
not a smart thing to do. So the idea behind the Drifter was um, that the name made sense for us because of all the train tracks around us. Um, Steve loves to travel. I mean, he has been all over the world. Um, you have a drink with him, a beer with him sometime, and his stories about traveling are, are really fascinating. So we tried to take, you know, our, our, our rural routes here in Stillwell, Kansas, with all the train tracks, and the Bowie, the Bowie shape just made sense on this one. And um, we wanted a little bit bigger handle profile on the backside, and we wanted it to taper down and get a little narrower and a little sexier as it got to the blade. And um, if it didn't have some really neat, sexy curves, we, were, we thought we'd have trouble with it. And um, again, it, the, uh, all the way across the back, all the way across the spine, it is straight as an arrow, a little curve on the back, a little curve on the front, but the, the Bowie blade, um, the Bowie blade's pretty neat. And then uh, QSP is like, hey, let's add some grind lines to this thing. We're like, yeah, let's do that. So we worked out a way to um, do some, it's gonna probably have a satin, no, not probably, it is having a satin and a stone wash finish on the blade to really show off those grinds and, or those edges. And um, so, yeah, Steve's like, we need a Bowie knife. Let's make it happen. And so that's what we came up with. And um, the sticker on that one's fun. The marketing on that one's fun. It's actually got train tracks running through it. Yeah. And um, get a, just another fun little story. And it's all about being a traveler. And, you know, you, you got to have some sort of little uh, pocket knife with you when you're traveling for whatever reason. And we thought this one would fit the bill. The, uh, the design of it, uh, of the blade itself has mm -hmm. just a touch of menace, you know, and that's what, <laughs> yeah. that, that's what everyone wants. You know, you, even, even though this is a small knife and, and it's not, uh, but just a touch of menace, everyone who does not like that in their blade, especially if it's something that's tapping into your imagination a little bit, like, um, you know, like this kind of old school, you were talking about how you've got a little bit of creativity in you or a lot apparently. Mm -hmm. And it's funny because, you know, that that sort of you know also your love of history back you know in earlier times everyone had to have as a matter of survival a little bit of creativity in them because mm -hmm. you're always solving problems that you don't just can't just pick up a phone couldn't just pick up a phone and have someone come solve your problems for you so that creativity uh, you know I, I see how it comes out in these designs yeah it's you know steve and i are both um we're not the business types we'll, we'll be the first to admit when it comes to running the business side of things um we'll make mistakes and um we're learning and we're leaning on a lot of people um for business strategies retail strategies and um, we're both we both love the creative process and um the the business side is um it's not it's a necessity obviously uh, but neither of us really, we don't love it, but we know it's, it's very, very important, but we lean on, um, we lean on a lot of folks to help guide us through some of those things. And, you know, when we first started Finch, we thought, you know, uh, we thought we'd use uh, Steve's business model with his watch brand and sell direct. And um, as we started flushing it out and started learning more about the community and all the EDC folks, it just, everyone, it, it, everything was saying you need to we need to look at a dealer program let's think about a dealer program so um we you know we're, we're not retail guys we didn't understand the the pricing strategies the cost strategies um supply and demand we we didn't that was all a foreign language to us and so we quickly you know took the crash course on retail marketing on retail pricing and um the dealer program has been fabulous for us it's we are, you know, Steve and I, I guess since we're so creative, I think the selling side is probably a little uh, nerve wracking and it's intimidating to us. But we've been really fortunate that the dealers that we're picking up is they've been coming to us and which has just been fabulous. And some have been referred to us. Some um, we've had some some of the knife guys say, hey, you need to reach out to these guys or I'm going to have them reach out to you. And what's just been so amazing is how helpful everybody is in the in the knife community. When we went to Blade Show in 2019, um, just Steve and I, we just flew down for a day and a half. And uh, we didn't really know what we were getting into. Um, and he had a watch customer um, or a watch fan, um, Adam Purvis. And he, we told him we were going to be in town. He's like, I'm coming. I'm going to meet you. I'm going to introduce you to some folks. 
And he took us around. He didn't know us and he didn't know what our plan was. We tried to share with him what we could. And at that point, we really didn't know what we were getting into yet. And he took us around the show. He introduced us to all these people. And um, it's just been so much fun. Everybody has been so helpful. And if a dealer thinks, you know, if we're if we're doing something wrong, our dealers have been fabulous. But, hey, let's rein this in or let's do this. Um, the dealers are great about, I mean, um, our, our, our invoicing and our pricing. They, they, it's just been everything on that business side has been fabulous. And it's been great for Steve and I because we're just not. You know, if we were at Blade Show and we had a table, it's fun for people to walk up and we could talk and have those conversations. But as for creative guys to maybe pick up a phone and call a cutlery store out of the blue, that's asking a lot for either of us to do. It's just not, we're just not comfortable with it. So fortunately, the dealer program has just been, it's just been incredible. And they're gobbling up all of our inventory. And, you know, we're trying, what we're trying to do is we always want, you know, some retail guys, some retail marketing guys might say, you're doing this the wrong way. But we always want to have, if there's a new guy getting into collecting or a new guy getting into carrying, you know, we want our knife to be an option for them. We always want them to be available. We don't want the supply to be at a point where they can't get one. And if they want to collect them, you know, there's some brands where they're hard to get. It'll drive, it'll drive potential customers away. So I, I just can't get one of these. And I guess that's a good problem to have. We just don't look at it as as we we're, we're trying to manage a supply that our dealers um, can always satisfy um, a new customer um, or an old customer if they lose if they lose a knife or break a knife or whatever. Um, so we're trying to manage that side of it, um, and we sell a little bit direct. But you know, we have like on our our website that you've shown. We sell a little direct, but mainly that's family and friends. Um, Ninety percent of what we produce is, uh, is is going to our dealer network, and that has just been um, the dealers like like the like the EDC guys and gals. The dealers are just as great as the guys and girls carrying the knives. It, it's just been incredible, and I can I, I lean on them for questions. As like I'll call one of our one of our dealers is a traditional pocket knives, Austin. And I bounce so much off of him and he is so open and friendly about, Hey, think about it this way, or let's look at this. And um, so Steve and I wouldn't be, we wouldn't be where we are today with, with all the designs we have coming, the, the designs we have for 2022, 2023. Um, this is all possible because we got so much help from so many guys. It's just, been, it's been incredible. It's so much fun. I think uh, the, the knife world, the knife industry is or this community you couldn't ask for a better um uh, kind of business environment to introduce yeah. yourself in uh I, I think because it's what you're saying here is just a um a repeating refrain i just keep hearing and my own personal experience tells me this is an amazing and very unique kind of uh slice of the business world because people help each other people yeah. want to see others succeed yeah. and and when you were talking about supply the supply side of things uh -huh. um i i really and, and i'm sure i speak for a lot of people i really admire that you strive to always have your product available um and, and i'm sure most do because who who wants to miss out on a sale but um you know it is a crowded market. It has become mm -hmm. more and more crowded with, with mm -hmm. every year. And, and uh, you know, I, I myself as a knife collector and uh, you know, junkie really like uh, <laughs> my, my attention can drift. And if there's a knife I really want, and I know it's not available for, you know, indefinitely mm -hmm. my attention, Oh, look, something shiny over here. Mm -hmm. And, 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 you know, there, I, I would imagine you're walking a fine balance between, you know, asking people wanting people to come back for more and making sure you have more you know for, yeah. for them to have but again yeah. at the same time you don't want to flood flood that market uh, that you know that niche that you have yeah you know what one of the things with with us not being involved in the actual manufacturing um you know we have you know our our schedule is up to the mercy of our of our factory schedules and for example the holiday um by by nobody's mistake but our own we made some last minute changes and, and it was it was headed to production we're like oh wait a minute let's let's adjust one little thing you know we we thought 
I was plan we were planning on marketing the holiday and selling it around the holidays. It just mm -hmm. made sense. Yeah. And um, we were going to have it ready to go in October and get it to the dealers. And, uh, you know, one thing led to another. The, 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 the first run of holidays show up like December. It was like December 17th. So the, the, the Christmas, the holiday buying season is, is pretty much come and gone. Yeah. So, you know, what Steve and I do is when, when, our not, when, our, when, a, when a run delivers to us, we go through all of them. I mean, our factories are great about their own QC, but then Steve and I have another level of QC that we want to do. Now, if we'll pull, you know, a tiny fraction of a percentage, there might be one or two out of a run. They're like, you know what, this one's not. We'll save this one for parts or warranty work or whatever. And so, you know, the, the, the holidays deliver like you know very december whatever it was we're like we wanted these out before christmas before the holiday season so we're going through them we're doing our qc we get our we get our brothers here we get our wives here my kids come help we're inserting the bank we you know we have a warranty card we have a band-aid we have the sticker um we have a, a flip in the fence sticker so we're all just you know doing going gangbusters because we wanted to get these to the dealers before before the new year and we were able to do it. But I, I guess the point of the story is, is yeah, we're trying to manage. So we've got a lot of knives in production. What we decided was let's, let's try to get some of that control back. Even if we're not ready to release or drop a new design, let's at least have it ready to go. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're getting, uh, so devil's finger, harvester, drifter, lucky 13. Um, I'm missing one road runner. Oh, that's what I was going to ask you about. And, and Cherry Bomb. So they're all being produced right now. And then we're not going to release them all at once. That would be crazy. That would be just suicide. But we're going to at least get them in. And then, okay, let's say July we'll drop one. Let's, let's drop another one. We hope our plan is to – we would love to offer and drop a new – four new designs a year. Um, that's kind of our, our – measuring stick if it's one under if it's three that's fine if it's five or six you know that's about what we're going to be comfortable with doing is maybe four or five six designs a year um on top of that then re then issue a new um new materials for a 1929 so for example the 1929 we have our third run actually delivering to us tomorrow um and it's three new three new handle options um and so we'll go through those get those to the dealers probably within the next you know month or so. Um, but so we're, we're trying to manage releasing existing designs and new um, options or new variations, then uh, four, five, six brand new designs each year. We're designing right now, we've probably got, I can't really see my, we've got a war board right behind me. We've probably got about um, 20, 23, somewhere in their low 20s designs that we're, we're building out through 20. We're about through 2023 right now. Oh, that's so and, great. And um, so, you know, the, the the design process, we keep it slow. Um, we've gotten prototypes in that, you know, we, we got it in. We're like, you know what? This one's just, we're not feeling this one. And we just put the prototype away and say, you know what? We invested those money well spent. We know, but we're not comfortable with it. So we've got a couple knives. We got all the all the way through prototype stage, and we just said, you know what? This isn't. There's something missing here. We've missed something. So we'll just table it and we'll readdress it down the road. And so of the 20 to 23 or so that I've mentioned, one of the, a couple of those might fall into that category. Like you know, we get it, and it's just it's just not. It's hit. It's missing. It's not. It's not. It's something's missing there. It's not. The story isn't complete, and um, so it. So yeah, we're busy designing, but it's it, it takes a lot of time. And you, you mentioned the the I'm sorry to interrupt you. You yeah, mentioned no, no, you're great. You mentioned the Roadrunner, uh, which uh -huh. is one of the prototypes that I've seen on your Instagram page that I haven't seen on your website yet. Yeah, tell me, I love this thing. Tell me the story about this knife. Okay, so this again, this this is going to get um, here. It is here. It's going to be in this burl wood, and I'm drawing a blank. We're doing. I'm drawing a blank on the other handle material. Um, definitely the Burlwood. So this one goes right back to growing up as a kid, Saturday morning cartoons, Wiley e. Coyote, the Roadrunner show. 
And we just wanted something. We were like, let's, we need something that's just kind of a sexy Italian looking kind of, when we see this one, we think it's, we think of Italian stiletto for some reason. Yes. I don't know why, but we both see that in this knife. And I was like, well, how do we tone down that viciousness? And I was like, well, let's give it a fun name. And, um, you know, we threw out Roadrunner. We were a little hesitant to call it a Roadrunner um, just for the fact that the company name is a bird and mm. we're naming a knife as another bird, but it just, it just fits. <laughs> yeah, right. It just fit really well. So I was like, you know what? Let's just go with it. We're going to yeah. throw, we're going to throw that rule out the window. And uh, this one's the Roadrunner. So yeah, we, um, this one is, uh, this one was really just a kind of a cousin of the holiday really. And, um, it, my son has a, a, a pro tech godson. And I think he has, is it the dawn? And, and so we took some inspiration from those. It's like, you know, it, there's, there's a flipper in there somewhere. And how do we make that work? And, um, so the marketing on this one, we've got, we're gonna have some fun marketing with it, with the, with the, with the Roadrunner and the Wiley Coyote. And um, this one, we just recently got into production. If it's not late this year, it'll, it, it'll be one of our next year models. Um, keep our fingers crossed for this year, but um, we're not sure yet. You, you can see how it shares DNA with the, um, with the holiday in the clip in the yep. bolster setup and also in the in cross section in the sort of squareness i i'm detecting that i i i love it i uh, i saw it you know i've seen it on your instagram feed a few times yeah I'm like, ooh, where is that and you know you don't see it on the website yet and uh, i i really i mean it's right up my alley i i well I think, we'll make sure we get you I one I, I, i'm i for some reason drawn a blank on our other handle option it's burlwood and something I, was I, red i saw something red like red uh, my oh, it's red. It's, it's red. It's jig bone and red. Thank you. Oh, See, jig, yeah. <laughs> jig bone. That. I, I, okay, so speaking of jig bone, which yeah. I absolutely love, and I don't see enough on flippers. Uh, I, I understand it's hard to work with, and it's hard to get uh, the 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 right sizes and that kind of thing. But uh, any plans for a Finch Knife Company to make a slip joint, as slip joints have had such a surge in popularity? Well, it's funny you ask because yes, we actually just finished our, we have five slip joint designs that we're working on right now. Mm -hmm. And they are all in those early engineering stages. Um, yeah, we are going to get into the slip joints. It's, it's, it, it is what my collection consists of at home. It's what my dad's collection consists of. Um, Steve is, Steve's got primarily flippers. Steve's got some slip joints. Steve was an Eagle Scout. Steve is an Eagle Scout. So he's got, he's got the Swiss Army knives and he's got all those dandies. So yes, to answer your question, slip joints are in the works. Um, I'm guessing maybe early 2022 or, or this time, this time next year is probably more realistic. Um, but yeah, we have five designs that we're working on and, um, they are, they're going to all, they're, two of them are traditional. One is, a, we're working on a sow belly version with three blades. Mm. And then the other ones are all single blade. And um, so the sow belly is just really just a hit on, um, this is one of my case knives that I just absolutely love. It's, it's a stockman there, right? That with the three blades. The th this is here. Yeah. This, um, sorry. Yeah. This, this guy it was an ass. I don't even know who did the scales on this one. It's just something really funky, but I, I just love it. I love the color. I love the swirl. So we're working on our interpretation of that. And then the other four are really, um, really, we just kind of started from scratch and they're going to be smaller and smaller than they're, they're all going to be about probably 1929 size, uh, but nothing bigger than that. And, um, yeah, the slip joints I'm really excited about, and they will all have a fun story as well, and there's some inspiration for all those as well. So, yes, we are. Slip joints are in the works, um, hopefully not too, not, not in the not-too-distant future. So in terms of the company, um, how you know, you said you have 20-some-odd um, uh, designs kind of uh -huh. in the can or working their way towards the can. Uh where do you want to see the company in 10, 20 years? Is it going to be a giant uh, 
I, do you want to bring manufacturing in, under your own roof at some point, or where do you see the company going? Yeah, you know, that's a good question. Um, when we first started, uh, we the, the thought was, is let's, how, how can we put this together to eventually be a manufacturer? So uh, we actually went and talked to a good friend of mine who has a manufacturing company here in Kansas City, a totally different level of manufacturing. They do um, trade show booths and they do displays for Hall of Fames and sporting arenas and all that kind of thing. So we went and talked to him just about the manufacturing process in general. And, you know, he really shied us away from right now. Let's let's you guys need to concentrate on the brand and the marketing, the quality, the customer service. And in, in, in five years, if if we could figure out a way to bring that here, sign me up for that. My dad's my dad um, owned a printing business. So he's been in the manufacturing business at, a, at another level. So the manufacturing process is incredibly fascinating. It, it obviously comes with its own batch of headaches. Um, but yes, if, if there's one day, it, it's it's on our minds. How how is that going to be possible? And once we've once we've established ourselves and and the brand is 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 growing and and um, we haven't worn out our welcome. Yes, man. If if we could figure out a way to do that. Uh, we're all in with that, um, but that that's a whole nother beast that um, that is skilled folks that, you know, like I said earlier on, it's, you know, Steve and I, we 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 just know design wise what we like and we turn it over to the, the experts. And um, if we could locate those people to do that and help us grow that, we would be we would we would love to do that. Um, so yeah, that would be that would be an absolute dream come true if if we can make the manufacturing here in Kansas. That would be incredible. Well, it really seems like you and Stephen, and maybe this has to do with the fact that uh, you're such old friends going so far back. But mm -hmm. the two of you seem to really have a, a design uh, magic or a language together, and I really really like what you've been doing. And uh, like I said in my open, I think I think they all have real character and the fact that you've chosen some great manufacturing that that's sort of if you like the design you can trust it's going to be a good knife yeah. and and i love your design so I, I think you guys are doing awesome stuff i can't wait to see where you go next oh thank you i it's it has been a blast and and being able to have these kind of conversations with you guys and, and guys like you is fabs we missed blade show this year we both had uh, our personal schedules got out of control so we were signed up for Blade Show. We had to back out last minute. So we know we missed on just some fabulous, fabulous conversations and meeting great people. And, and you know, when we left Atlanta two years ago, we're like, if we can make this work, this is going to be special because the people are special. And it's just it's just a breath of fresh air because, you don't. I don't know if every community or every industry, I don't know if everybody can say that. And the knife community can say that. It's just yeah. it's just awesome. Well, Spencer, thank you for coming on the Knife Junkie podcast. It's been a real pleasure. Oh, my gosh. Thank you for the time, and I look forward to many more conversations. Yep, right here, too. Take care. All right, take care. The Get Upside app is your way to get cash back on your gas purchases. Get Upside is an app you put on your smartphone, and whenever you need to get gas, search your area for savings, claim your discount, fill up your tank, and then take a picture of the receipt with your phone. And that's it. You've just got cash back. Visit theknifejunkie.com forward slash save on gas to get the app and start saving. Again, that's theknifejunkie.com slash save on gas. There he goes, Spencer Marquardt of Finch Knife Company. Uh, you can check them out at their many dealers. Uh, they have a list on their website or you can buy directly from them, making some really cool knives that, uh, boy, they really appeal to my sentimental side. Uh, so thank you, Spencer, and of course, Stephen in absentia. Uh, if you like these kind of interviews, uh, check back with us next Sunday and the Sunday after that and the Sunday after that. And uh, also check out our live streams every Thursday night and the Wednesday Supplemental. So for Jim working his magic behind the switcher, I'm Bob DeMarco saying, don't take dull for an answer.
Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to bob at theknifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Thank you.